Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around for such a long day. I am actually also based in Vancouver Technically School okay. of Interactive Arts and Technology, but I have been in Berlin for the past uh, half year, but I just ended my project there this August. But thank you very much for also organizing this event and giving me this opportunity to connect with everyone with whom I see so much um, intersection of the kind of projects that we are doing. Uh, so we're in, in beautiful Vancouver in British Columbia School of Directive Arts Technology at Simon Fraser University. And I have the honor to present this paper on the behalf of all of my colleagues. Um, we actually had a few other team members as well who chose to remain anonymous for this paper as well, but it was a um, larger group project that uh, we embarked on over a two years period, technically. Um, but first of all, before I jump into this paper, I want to give a very small glimpse of the kind of work that we do in our lab. Uh, and I literally saw connections with like, almost every single paper that has been presented here. So it's been a very exciting place for me. Uh, so at the top, you kind of see this very embodied, like all of them are very bodily centric works. So the Body Remix project um, was a multi user interactive uh, VR installation where you uh, come into the virtual space, your body is being transformed into this particle based body. So you see other people around you represented as those virtual auras, and you can connect and exchange particles with them while the entities are being kind of uh, hidden behind those very abstract general bodies. And you can create this very embodied form of connection, engagement, and expressive movement with them. Uh, the second project, the Star Staff, uh, is created by this, uh, John Disner Stewart. I recommend you look it up on the uh, Oculus um, Store. You can download it. It's a very cool experience where you can uh, transform into star field and then interact with different stars and other people around you as well. Um, okay. Um, we're also engaged in some some aesthetic workshops uh, uh, as a part of our design process. Where we're really trying to cultivate our Somatic sensibilities to our bodily experience as a, as a site of knowledge for our design processes and kind of identifying what kind of bodily qualities we want to uh, design for. And the uh, project at the bottom is kind of my main focus is on breathing synchronization, where use breathing sensors uh, as a part of the virtual environment interaction to help people connect with each other through breathing synchronization uh, in the virtual world as well. But you can look up other projects on our website as well. But today I'm going to focus on the very specific other section uh, that is a little bit further away from very bodily focused work while it still remains fairly embodied in a kind of complicated way that I'll go in a little bit in the discussion. So uh, we work a lot on designing for self-transcendent experiences that have been uh, coming up in the discussion yesterday and today as well where we've talked about the overview effect which is this experience that astronauts have when they see the Earth from out of space and they have this very profound moment. Uh, realizing how beautiful our planet is and how everything is interconnected and we're part of this big system we need to unite together to protect it. Um, and there's the experience of flow that we were discussing yesterday as well and kind of this interconnectedness of the mycelium that we've been talking about a little bit. So all of this kind of falls under this umbrella of self-transcendent experiences. So we're interested in those experiences because they have this transformative potential that they can help us evolve ourselves as human beings, as individuals, and kind of realize our global interconnectedness with nature and the world around us. Uh, they also are observed in a very particular, intense form, uh, as when they describe as mystical experiences, which occur for people when they experience different psychedelic drugs. Uh, it's a very intense sensory experience for them as well, and uh, it has this very strong sense of ego dissolution or reduction of self salience that is prominent and all of the self-transcendent experience that probably amplified the most in this uh, strong psychedelic experience that people might have. And it elicits this sense of global interconnectedness where you realize that you're just part of this planet together with all of the other living beings and other objects. Uh, and it overall shows some positive benefits in terms of increasing the quality of life and um, well-being and used in the, um, psychotherapy, things like that. But there's also some minor forms of uh, self-transcendent emotions that are not as intense and a little bit more accessible for people on an everyday basis. Uh, those emotions such as elevation, compassion, admiration, gratitude, love, and awe, where you kind of just feel a little bit less self-centric and kind of more connected with everyone around you. Uh, so we're interested to see how the technology can help us access those type of experiences, because while we can probably experience admiration and awe on a daily basis, 
some more intense forms of experiences like overview effect or psychedelic experience that I'm focusing on today are generally a little bit less accessible, they're more controversial, they have larger risk of different side effects, they often uh, can be illegal or at least taboo, so uh, we probably don't want to encourage everyone to have this experience, but maybe we can see if the technology can allow us to have a glimpse of it and bring some of those benefits through this multisensory experience. So in order to explore that, we decided to kind of focus on the experience that has been created by uh, Atlas uh, V, which is a great VR production company. I recommend you check out their work as well. Um, so we took a, an available commercial uh, VR experience and we wanted to analyze it in a high level of detail by combining two different methodologies. The first methodology is the autoethnography. This is a methodology which allows a very rich access to your individual experiences because it's an autobiographical process. You have an unlimited access to your own experience, you engage in a lot of different reflections, and you can really try to decipher all of the different elements of what kind of feelings, emotions, sensations might be coming up for you. How do you make meaning of this experience? How this meaning might be influenced by different past experiences that you had? And you can do it over and over again to kind of really understand the high level of detail of what this experience supports phenomenologically for you. While the close reading methodology is the methodology coming from the humanities uh, side, which focuses on analyzing of uh, media artifacts, which is, has a very similar iterative, long, uh, very detailed, fine grained process where you go through uh, an artifact and you try to understand how is it made, what kind of design elements have come together to create this particular. Uh, media artifact. And one uh, sort of interesting aspect of that of methodology maybe is also that it very much comes from the uh, perspective of the viewer or the immersant the receiver uh, of this artifact rather than the creator. So it's not interested in the creator's intent. You're trying to understand how this experience is, the, you're trying to understand the design as the immersant in this experience, how it would be experienced by someone who would just download it and go through that experience. So this gives us access to those two parts that we're interested in, very interested in understanding the phenomenological, psychological aspects of what kind of experience emerges for you and what kind of design um, elements have supported it, inhibited it, gave rise to it, uh, or elicited those parts of this phenomenological experience. So this is a very tricky kind of process to decipher. You really need to know uh, to understand the both sides of it, but it's kind of like the side of the same coin because you have the design elements and then elicit certain phenomenological reactions in you. Uh, so our research questions were in terms of understanding how well-reviewed VR experience of ayahuasca may elicit experiential elements that could be reminiscent of self-transcendent experience uh, that uh, this experience was designed to represent. So we were looking at the, what kind of experiences and emotions were elicited in this virtual experience and what kind of design elements were used to encourage this self-transcendent emotions in ayahuasca VR uh, and how our prior experiences might have shaped this experience with this VR, and what kind of design considerations we can glean from it. So I'm just going to show you a trailer of the experience so you can get a little sense of what we've gone through. <laughs> So you see this uh, uh, experience has been created as a tribute to a shaman uh, who has been leading people through those ayahuasca procedures in the Brazilian forest. And uh, the creator has gone through those rituals over a period of it, over decades. So he has really kind of based the design of it in his own experience and perception of being a part of those ayahuasca rituals. So for our procedure, we started from writing a disclaimer in, uh, in order to outline what kind of expectations we have how we're feeling that day, what kind of we might bring into our experience. 
And then we also took care to engage with 10 minute meditation before starting the experience in order to kind of disengage from the stresses and other busyness of our uh, day to day activities and prepare ourselves to be attuned to our experience before going into VR. Um, then we um, engaged in the Ayahuasca Cosmic Journey, uh, went through the experience, recorded it in our process, and then we went into writing a reflection, which is a key part of an ethnographic process. You have to journal about the experience, try to um, jot down what kind of feelings, thoughts, emotions came out for us during this process. Um, then we came, went back and viewed the recording of our experience and augmented this reflection. Then we met in small groups and in larger groups and have the discussion of uh, what kind of things have uh, come up to us. And then we, based on those discussions, we refined our analytical lenses we used to focus our attention and our experience. And then we went over this process over and over again for a year, basically. <laughs> uh, and similarly for the close reading part, uh, we also were either going back to the Ayahuasca VR experience itself or going through it again, this time focusing on the design elements as opposed to just trying to experience it as it is, um, and then also write down our findings and uh, discussing and revising our design lenses that allow us to focus on different aspects of the experience, such as the sensorium, narrative, embodiment, agency, and so on. So we're gonna quickly go through some of the findings, but you can read more in our paper. So in terms of the content theme of the experience, there's a lot of those uh, aspects were based on different contrasts such as contrast between warm and cold colors or confined and vast spaces. And the narrative arc was kind of oscillating between those different contrasting aspects, um, which is also can relates to this ideas of how uh, VR experience could be embodied based on just the visuals that you're receiving. I uh, looked at some colors yesterday in terms of what kind of effect they can have, and definitely the confinement space gives you an embodied sense of either being kind of vast and open and elevated or being kind of confined and having to surrender and struggle through that experience. Um, agency was an important part for us as well to look at. Uh, it's a generally very much on rails experience, so it just takes you through all of it as it goes. Um, and this, while it's typically not um, maybe the most beneficial use of VR technology that could allow you to explore experiences, which it was very relevant in case of trying to represent the psychedelic experience because we had to surrender our agency to VR in a similar way how people have to surrender their agency in case when they're taking the psychedelic drugs and they just have to let it take them on a, their own journey. Uh, however, there were some elements of agency that were included. Um, the one that I personally really appreciated because this experience was challenging for me, there is a way to kind of control the um, intensity of the experience at the beginning. Uh, you can like, try to shake it out of your head, <laughs> so that by the movement you uh, reduce the intensity of the images that you're getting, you kind of get a little bit more normal view for a little while, but eventually you have to surrender and go through. Um, and there is also an uh, interaction that some of us noticed and some didn't, uh, is that you can use your gaze in order to navigate through the environment and fly in this like, beautiful cathedral-like uh, space. And uh, this is just a small glimpse of this intense part that you can shake out and you have this anthropos um, kind of enveloping you and it's very uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, the next uh, aspect I want to talk about is the embodiment. So while there is no virtual body in the, this particular experience, so also found that it was likely relevant to the um, the kind of experience that I was trying to represent, because in psychedelic experiences, you also often have this sense of ego dissolution where you become sort of less aware of the actual boundaries of your own body, and you just have this more like non dual awareness style of experience where you kind of experience lots of sensory things, but then not confined to your bodily shape. Uh, however, as I mentioned, you also do have some embodied experience in it, even though that you don't have the virtual representation of your body, but you experience being confined in those different spaces that you're going through. And there's also several somatic memories that were brought up for people who have some relevance to those experiences. So if they had experience with uh, psychedelics before, they could have some somatic sensations coming up, like experience with nausea, for example, which is very common for uh, everyone who's taking um, Ayahuasca. They were reminded of. So lots of uh, experience was around discomfort and kind of everyone made their own meaning of it. So 
Um, people were remembering uh, the notion they had after just seeing the bottle uh, of the brew in the virtual space. They had this notion reminded in them. Also, uh, coincidentally, VR technology can produce notice experience as well, that kind of aligned well with the type of experience it was trying to represent. Um, there's lots of different uncomfortable visual stimuli, which means that they had to really persevere through that experience that is also similar to the most uh, influential um, psychedelic experiences that people have and reported. Um, it was very open in the interpretation, it was a very abstract kind of um, experience, so it was not ever telling you anything about what you're supposed to, um, to think about it and make meaning of it. It was just different nature-inspired and different metaphorical uh, elements, and then we all made our own meaning, which is very much uh, grounded in our own experience and cultural differences. Uh, we had a very different interpretation of different aspects. Uh, one example of it is the snakes that were very prominent as well, uh, while some of us um, felt that snakes were very evil beings, others felt that it was kind of wise creatures that are taking you on this journey and showing you what the connection with the nature means. It's a small example of the being inside a snake in a kind of uncomfortable environment. Okay. And it observes self-transcendent emotions. Uh, some emotions that we have noted that we have experienced, there is some love and gratitude uh, for some of us uh, experienced towards the shaman in the experience, and for others, there is also those emotions brought up in relation to your own ancestors or family members that you have been reminded of by um, going through this journey. Um, there's also emotions of awe and vastness when coming into this space that you see in this image of kind of wide open space and flying towards the bird and the eye that uh, you eventually go into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so then some open questions that I wanted to uh, bring up for the discussion. Um, so it was a, looking at like how virtual reality technology might be able to maybe elicit the self-transcendent experiences that we're interested in, uh, where um, um, wanted to kind of be conflicted with this idea that uh, the experiences that you have when you ingest psychedelics, it's a very internal experience that kind of goes from inside out, while VR just kind of pops the screen on, uh, on your face. So it's very controversial to consider how much this externalized outside-in experience can elicit the similar type of quality of experience, but what we have observed uh, in our group is that if you had some experiences prior to this one, uh, then going into VR experience can re-invoke some of the similar qualities for you and you can kind of re-experience and bring the same benefits for you. Whether you've never had any kind of context in your lived experiences, then it's going to be very different from the interpretation. We also want to consider some cultural impact that uh, this technology can have on people uh, that um, because the RS experiences are very cultural the rich cultural history of rituals that have been done in a particular group in Brazilian forests, uh, and uh, using it in the VR kind of trivializes a little bit of what those um, experiences mean. And the last thing that I want to mention is uh, um, how those type of experiences are meant to be transformative and self-transcendent. Uh, they're being presented just in the Steam VR platform where you download it next to a Beat Saber, uh, and uh, your expectation of what you're going to go in is very different from uh, what the actual Ayahuasca ritual is, which takes you like two months to prepare for. So how can we think of how we can prepare people and think of this process? And on this note, I want to thank you for your attention. And... Well, so technically we don't...